Hello. It's double A S L R once again on this. What is it? This is Wednesday, the Wednesday. second of the November. Yes. Of the and, November. And Ian's here. I am. He's never been here before. Now, well, at least not in the AA, not on the double A S L R. He's down in yeah. He's not been here. No, it's a true statement. I don't think I have. No. No, so, I yeah. don't think you have. And then he also has something else that's never been on the AA SLR, and that's Teams, Microsoft Teams. Yeah. So yeah, what's no. up with Teams? Sure. So uh, yeah, so thanks for having me. One, also check out Bo's music at nobandwidth.io, uh, that, that lovely yes, intro yes, music indeed. shredding guitar. So yeah, uh, basically today what I wanted to talk to folks about is there's been a lot of Ballyhoo and a lot of uh, information going around about these open SSL three vulnerabilities. And we're not going to spend a lot of time digging into that other than to kind of touch on why those vulnerabilities kind of triggered this conversation about teams. So uh, the open SSL vulnerability has a lot of people patching going through what do we need to do? Well, some people will say, hey, th this this takes an incredibly well crafted phishing email to actually exploit. But that's actually not what I'm concerned with. What I'm concerned with is a lot of the other downstream effects. When this type of vulnerability hits? How quickly am I patching? How quickly am I notifying people? How quickly am I resolving? And if I am doing all those things, how am I tracking them? How am I making sure that later when internal audit or other leadership comes to us and says, hey, what did you do about this? And when did you do it? It's the, it's the classic kind of audit question or even legal question of, uh, you know, what did you know and when did you know it? especially if something happened where whatever vulnerability you're working on ends up becoming some sort of breach or incident response exercise. So today we're going to cover just briefly at a high level some of the information that has come about about OpenSSL. And then I'm going to show you how to apply it in Teams, right? And you say, Teams, how is that a security tool? I want to do that. Well, in the same way that Excel isn't a security tool, folks, because we all know that spreadsheets power security. Teams allows you to go to where the people are working. One of the one of the things, if we if we have to try and figure out a way to look on the bright side of the pandemic, one of the things that happened was just this explosion of expertise in how to do remote work, right? And Teams really helped enable that. And one of my core tenants, whenever I'm doing security, whether it be vulnerability management, whether it be penetration testing, whatever it is, security improvements, engineering, anything, the first thing I want to do is make sure people, I go to where the people are, I don't bring them to my process, right? So you might have this incredible tool for tracking vulnerabilities. You might have these unbelievable threat and vulnerability managers. You might have a SOAR platform. And even when you think about the SOAR platform, the whole purpose of that is going through and automating, getting things into the systems where those people work, right? So we're going to talk about how you turn things in teams where people are already working, they're already communicating, they're already used to going, and using that to drive the resolution and vulnerability management, right? So I do have to do a couple of visual props here just to give you an idea of why this is important, right? So... Some of you who've seen me on webcasts and whatnot before know my, my hat rack back there that says, let me put on mine. You'll notice there's a few missing because in this particular webcast, what are we going to be doing, right? So first thing, we got our security hat on. We say, okay, well, yeah, we've got a, we've got a vulnerability and we need to patch it and we need to change configuration on it and we need to do all these different things to inventory and figure out what's going on. But oh, hey, guess what? While the security engineering team's doing what they need to do, the blue team has got to go through and figure out what indicators of compromise are there, what other pieces of the puzzle can help protect us while we get this resolved. Now, I'm not necessarily speaking directly to the open SSL vulnerabilities that are out there right now. What I'm saying is anything. I don't want to teach you how to use this just for this thing coming up. I want to teach you how to use this holistically to make your life easier. But then you got to say, well, wait a minute. As I'm doing this, we still have a business to run, right? I can't just go through and patch everything and make sure that, hey, everything's working, everything's running, there's no problems, no issues. No, you're going to have to talk to the representatives from the business and figure out when can we do this. This is critical. We do have to do these things. When is it going to have the least amount of impact for you? And is there something I can do to make that less impactful? And we can do that 
using Teams. Now, the last one, and the reason I truly, truly enjoy using Teams, I mean that, enjoy using Teams for vulnerability management, is this one, compliance and audit. What I'm going to show you today basically creates an atomic audit trail to say when the auditors come back and you've taken off all your hats and the issue's resolved and they say, hey, there was this big newsworthy vulnerability. How did we handle it? When did we know about it? How did we take action? How do we know that we were accurate and complete? Well, that's what I'm going to show you today how to use these tools that already exist in your environment. And I will be focusing just on tools that are from Microsoft that you should have in any Teams platform. I'm The one I'm going to be showing you is uh, a Business Pro license, the one that actually kind of gets you into that business tier. So hopefully you're using at least that. But I don't want to show you anything that's an add-on. I don't want to show you like links to Trello. I don't want to show you any of that because many of you are probably listening from small shops or yes, you have access to Teams, but maybe you don't have access to put in external plugins and you still want to be able to get things done. So that's where I'm going to focus to show you. So as I mentioned, and oh, by the way, feel free to throw questions in as, as we're going and whatnot. I'll be happy to try and answer them as I see the chat come up. So pulling over on my screen here, this is where this, this thought started from, right? So... I'm pulling up the uh, NCSSC from the, the Netherlands, right? This is their kind of cert. And they often do really good work, just like CISA does here. But I love that they have this stuff kind of out in their GitHub. And they broke down this, you know, spooky SSL vulnerability because it came out on, on Halloween. Fine. Okay. Um, but they have all the links to the advisories. And they have other software and scanning and things that you can do. I love that they include things like here are the Yara rules for your blue team. Here are the Windows rules for your blue team. Here are things that you can do in Linux and whatnot. They actually give you actionable things to do to try and find out, you know, is your environment either vulnerable or is someone trying to use this vulnerability to compromise you? On our newscast yesterday, John brought this article up, right? And believe me, this all ties into what we're about to look at. That, so, that was two days ago. Oh, that was two, no, it wasn't. It was yesterday. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was Monday. It was Monday. It was yesterday, Ryan. Uh, uh, okay, so it's two days ago. We've lost time. Got it. Uh, which is not unusual in this industry. Um, so, notes on OpenSSL remote. Now, this is some deep math. I am not a deep math person, right? And uh, as John said on the newscast two days ago, uh, you know, if you can, if you understand what all this stuff means. Please apply at jobs at blackhillsinformationsecurity.com. Um, yeah, jobs at blackhillsinfosec.com. That's right. Uh, and if you do understand this, this is your jam. Man, that's awesome. It's not mine. And to be honest, it's not most defenders. This is a very specialized thing. So what you're left doing is saying, well, all right, uh, what does this affect? And maybe it you say, okay, well, we don't have the CPUs with that instruction set. So maybe we can capture just the ones that do. Uh, hey, this CVE that's tied to it, uh, well, you have to have a CA that's been compromised or CA issuing malicious certificates. So am I really worried about that? Before I actually go into Teams and we start building this out, um, this is what I'm worried about, this one here. So the researcher that originally uh, grabbed this info, right, and, and well, not grabbed it, but, um, you know, published it, and said, hey, this is the vulnerability I found. They actually said, hey, you know, FYI, this, uh, some of the other stuff that I'll be releasing soon could deal with hash collisions and uh, create hash collisions in SHA-3. And if you remember with SHA-2 and Shattered, as soon as you can create hash collisions, mm, frankly, uh, your, avail your integrity of a lot of your security tools are going to be a huge problem. Now, I am speculating right now. But what I'm saying is there's more to come on this, clearly. Um, this is being reevaluated. Uh, there's other uh, posts in different uh, forums around PHP and Python that the, uh, the maintainers are saying, hey, when does the upstream issue get published about Kekak and Kekak being SHA-3, uh, that hashing algorithm? So if there's an upstream issue with that code, this is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. I hope that I'm wildly, wildly wrong. But that doesn't matter because these vulnerabilities 
that exist in this in these open source modules. If you're a PCI shop, you still got to fix them. If you've got them in your CDE, they're of a vulnerability rating that uh, you have to fix them or you're not going to be able to pass either an ASV scan, an accredited scanning vendor, or uh, your internal quarterly scans. If you're a uh, <laughs> hoax paragon there, I said the same thing. I'm like, so, when this came out, like somebody at the NSA is like, oh, you burnt my toy. Um, but yeah, so let's assume that you're one of those environments, right? And you're struggling with vulnerability management and patch management, right? You're trying to figure out how, to, I, I can't do this. This team works out of Jira. This team works out of SharePoint. This team works out of Azure DevOps. This team works out of that. And I've got to try and figure out how to convince them to do what I need to do. Well, that's why I like Teams. So let's actually go over to Teams. Let's actually do those demos because that's what this call is all about, right? So on, on your screen here, you'll see I have a, a little LLC that I keep open, mostly for playing with stuff. Uh, and this is the team site uh, the teams uh, from it, right? So this is not any proprietary information. This is a clean blank slate default setup for uh, enterprise, what is it? Uh, enterprise premium, or not enterprise, I'm sorry, business business premium, whatever Microsoft's calling it these days. It's not E5, I'll tell you that. So if I had a new vulnerability that I wanted to track, I could do two things, right? I can go through and say, I want to create a new team site. And hopefully you're allowed to create new team sites inside of your uh, inside of your organization. And I say, hey, I want to create a new team site. Now, you're generally going to do this no matter what, right? And you can do this from scratch. Once you have one set up, maybe you're just cloning it. But obviously, we're going to do it from scratch. So I'm going to make this a private channel. Now, why? Why would I make this a private team site? For the same reason that I don't just say, oh, you've got service now, just start putting tickets in saying, I need you to research this, or I need you to go through and take this report out of uh, Nessus or Nexpos or Rapid7 or Qualys or whatever your big you know, vendor is or however you've discovered the vulnerabilities in your environment, and I need you to go and fix them. Personally, I don't like to do that. Now, I'm not saying tickets shouldn't be created. What I'm saying, yes, Corvus, need to know. When you are in the, it just like uh, incident response, just like that, you only give the information to the people that need it because early on you're having conversations that are, are we even vulnerable? Is this an issue? What's going on? And you need to be able to have those conversations openly and with a certain level of trust with the people that you're working with, that it's not going to be in a ticketing system read by everybody. And even worse, you have somebody internal to the organization that reads that ticket and maybe they're feeling a little malicious that day. I'm not saying maybe they're a, you know, insider threat or anything like that, but maybe they are. So I like to limit this to just the people, as Corvus said, that need to know, right? So we'll say private and I'm going to call this channel vulnerability management. Now you're, you can choose any name for your organization, whatever it is you might like it to be. Cool. So we're going to say that and we're going to create that team site. Now, I mentioned in the thing that there's a couple tricks that I like to use. Now, I only have one member in here. This is the default site. It's me. So I can't really add anybody right now. And I'll call out where that becomes a little challenging for the demo. But so I'm going to say skip. And now I've got my site plain Jane. No problem. It's just a site, right? But the very first thing that I want to do, and a lot of people don't realize this exists, is I want to come up here in my my site here where I've got like the general tab and I want to say get email address. What this does is this generates a unique email address that can be emailed from anywhere that will go into the posts on here. And why is this important? Once you start getting other teams to do things like reaching out to vendors for your supply chain to say, "Hey, we use your tool." Have you patched this yet? You can include that email address. And when that email goes out, not only will it end up in the posts in this channel so that everyone can see it in one place, but it will also end up in files. And uh, a folder will be created inside of here. And I can go through and maybe in the other window, uh, pull this up so you see what I'm talking about. So I am going to send an email from there so that you see exactly what I'm talking about. And it's the silliest trick and the silliest feature, 
but you'll see the beauty of it in a moment, especially when months from now, your internal audit team or an incident response team or whoever you've got to answer to about when you patched this vulnerability, you can go through and pull up every email in time stamped uh, order inside of these posts. So let me go get my Black Hill email. There we go. And we will say, uh, all right, two, and I'm going to paste that in. So I've got my email address in there, and I am going to say a message. And VOD to get all the wisdom what it's okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, let's take a look here. So I'll hit send. And what's going to end up happening here in a second is this will get processed and we'll see it. Uh, hopefully, there, there it is. And we'll see that Ryan is the insider threat. Dun, dun, dun. So there's the email, right? Every email that comes in that's copied to that will show up in this post in the order in which it was received, which is fantastic because one of the other things you'll see is the way we set up the meetings in a moment also thread in real time to this area, right? So you'll see meeting kicked off, attendance for that meeting, all of a sudden, well, we'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. But now that we got an email in here, I can see more, I can see the rest of it. I just did a short email there. Um, and I can say, download original email, great. I get an EML file that I can quickly send off to audit if they want one in specific. But once the exercise is over, either vulnerability management or incident management or whatever, you can go into files over here and you'll notice I now have a new folder. And in that folder is that EML file. And if there were attachments on that EML file, it'd be in that folder too. All of it is ready to be captured, zipped up, and sent to your auditors, internal or external, time-stamped through Microsoft, through their things. There is no argument about repudiation. When did you receive it? Because that's the question auditors ask all the time, and I don't blame them, right? They say, hey, yeah, you gave me this evidence, but when was it generated, and when did you capture it? So if, you, if the evidence was generated three months ago, and you're sending it now, why? What's missing? They might have a time range that say, we want these log files all the way up to the last week. Okay, now you've got a perfect timestamp here in those files, et cetera. And as a matter of fact, once the exercise is over, there's no reason you don't just grant internal audit access to the channel or the team site and say, here's everything, go right ahead. So that's the first thing I like to do. I like to get that email address because then I can start plugging it into other things, right? So now that I've got this email address, uh, oh, I do have to touch on one thing. There, I mentioned there are two ways to do this. You can do a team site like I just did, right? You can do a team site, or you could have a singular team site and then have private channels below it for each vulnerability that you work on over time. And that way, your core group of people that often end up working on vulnerabilities and your engineering team or whatnot, they'll, they'll always have access, but you can also limit them right, to say, well, you have access to this channel, this channel, this channel, but not this one, this one, this one. That's very good if you're in a uh, highly siloed environment or one that that uh, you want to only manage one team site. So when audit says, what'd you do about these vulnerabilities? You just go to that one team site, you find the channel and, and you drop them in there. It does limit some of the features of teams, including planner. Uh, but I'll show you the ways that you can choose one or the other. Does Teams have data retention limits? Great question, Corvus. Uh, the short answer is, does it have them? Yes. Can you control them? Also, yes. So depending on your needs for retention, um, you will need to go through and, uh, I don't know if Microsoft envisioned Teams for vulnerability management. I'm sure they didn't, um, but that's what I use it for. Um, so. Uh, to answer Corvus's question, yes, there is retention, but do, 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 if you decide to go this route, check with your team's administrators if that isn't you and make sure that whatever level of data retention is turned on for you. So there's, uh, again, Microsoft changes the names all the time, but there's a data retention policy. And if you've got a legal or regulatory standard for keeping a hold of some of this stuff, you need to make sure that you say, hey, this team site is kept for however long. 
Um, you got to remember that Teams is really just a really slick um, interface over SharePoint. So pretty much anything that is a rule or configuration in SharePoint, you can probably get there in Teams. Shouldn't you also be backing up Teams anyway? Yeah, I mean, yes, um, you could likely do that. Uh, you would again want to talk to your, your Teams administrators. But what I've found for the most part is most of this information really is only good for uh, a financial year for the most part. Your auditors, especially if you're a Sarbanes-Oxley audited shop, are really only going to look back to the last audit. Um, your mileage may vary. You might be in a different industry. Consult your compliance folks as to how long you need to do that. But I've never had anybody ask for more than a year, so I've never never had that challenge. Um, moving on. Uh, so uh, you can do that two ways. Like I said, you can do channels here. We're doing a team site, and then you would just have a site for each of the major vulnerabilities that you're working on. Um, I do this outside of standard patch management. So like, if you've got something going on that needs attention now, this is what I do. All right. So now let's let's go ahead and add some of the other features in. I mentioned that we would go through and add some features in, right? So I'm going to go and add a tab. And here's a bunch of the applications that I can use to manage how I do vulnerability management. Now, I only use a couple. And some of you might be going, oh, Power BI. Yeah, that's the one, right? Hmm. Not as, not as much as you'd think. There's only one specific area that I found that I need Power BI. Uh, and 99% of the time, Teams changes enough all the time that I'd be constantly maintaining how Power BI pulls data and automates things. So I just don't. But again, you might be a Power BI expert and find ways of things that I've just described to say I can automate these. The ones that I end up using, and we'll load them in and I'll show you why, is I would use tasks by planner. And this is one that if you choose just the private channels, you're not going to be able to use this because you can't assign planner to private channels, which I really, really wish they would fix, but they have not. Um, so we're going to assume that you're using this uh, as a single team site. So I'm going to call this um, review items. I like to track things in basically three buckets. Uh, review items, it's just ideas. Hey, did we check on this? Did we ask this business unit? Did we call that other system administrator and find out what's going on? And if they have additional things that we should be looking at. If you are not treating vulnerability management like a conversation, you've already lost. And that's that, I mean, I will die on that hill that there is no CMDB, no inventory scanner, nothing that's going to be as effective as reaching out to the owners of those systems and asking them where the skeletons are buried. Period. You need to do both. But if you're not doing the conversations, forget it. And these lists that you'll create, these tasks and planners and things, are where you can track those conversations to say, yes, I did talk to them. Yes, I sent them an email. Yes, I put that email item on there so that when audit later says, well, did you talk to the person in the Singapore office about whether they're patched? Yes. And here's the timestamp and here's the email and here's the record. And it's all right there. Often dealing with an incident or vulnerability management isn't about perfection. It's about doing the right thing with the information that you have. It's due diligence and due care which for those of you who deal with a lot of lawyers will be very familiar with those terms. It's the due diligence is, did we ask the right questions and the due care? Did we do the right thing with the answers we got that a competent professional would have done? So if we're using planner, and I'll also show you how we use lists, right? But uh, if we're using planner, you create a new bucket. We got to do's, add new bucket, et cetera. I'm going to change these, right? I want to change this to review items. And I want to change uh, this one to maybe uh, remediation items. And maybe the next one I change to, or maybe I add another bucket for um, uh, control vulnerabilities. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. And maybe I will add another bucket called partner vulnerabilities. And finally, I would add one for validation. And you might have 
a longer set of processes, right? Um, you might have a longer set of processes, but if you're familiar with a Kanban board, you'll be very familiar with Planner, right? So I can go through and add a task, and let's say my first task is uh, running a vulnerability scan because we have a CVE and we have a signature for it, and we say I want to, we need to um, create vulnerability scans. Cool. And often the due date would be on these very early, especially if you're working on something there. And then I would say assign, I'm going to assign it to myself and hit add task, right? Now I have a task here. Now, why did I do that that quickly? Because there's way more information that you can populate in and I highly suggest you do it. You can add labels. I can go through and add a label and call it, you know, critical, or I can call it, uh, you know, PCI, or I can call it socks or something like that. Whatever is important in your organization where auditors and leaders are going to say, does this affect our regulated or contractually bound environments? As you discover those things, start tagging them. So you can very quickly answer those. But I'm not going to put any labels for now. Progress, I can say in progress, priorities, very, you know, normal there. Start date, we'll say today, does not repeat. Let's say you've got a task that's going to have to repeat daily, rerun scans, etc. You can do that. Put in what needs to be done. And then I love these checklists. If this is multiple things like vulnerability scans, right? I can go through and say, uh, run a, uh, you know, network scan and then run a, uh, uh, I don't know, um, uh, DAST, dynamic application uh, security testing. I can run a SAS static uh, for my static code. Um, I can run, you know, whatever. Whatever tools and technologies that are in your tool belt, you plug them in here under create vulnerability scans. And the reason you want to track those things granularly is later when someone who's not in the heat of the moment, who's not dealing with a million emails and executives stopping by every five minutes because they saw a post on LinkedIn that said this was going to wreck the company. Here's where you jot down those things so you don't forget. Did we run the Veracode scan? Did we run the, you know, uh, Fortify scan? Did we run whatever it is, right? And then you can also do things like uh, attachments. So once you get the vulnerability scan, once you get those other pieces, you can attach them right here and say, here's the finding, here's the finding, here's the finding. Put comments in, etc. cetera, right? Let's say this was a task that once resolved, like we say this task is actually patching the environment, right? We can take this and say, cool, we need to patch. Now we move it over here. Okay, um, I think we're good. Let's move it over to validation and let's reassign it to whomever needs it. One of the reasons that I love, or one of the many reasons I love using Teams for this, especially if you're using Planner, one, it allows me to keep that separation that you can have kind of those, uh, uh, what's the uh, Chatham House rules, where everyone in here can speak very plainly, but we're also not gonna be accusatory. I don't care that you didn't patch the system. I don't, it doesn't, I don't care. That's not the problem we're dealing with right now. The problem that we're dealing with is remediating and securing the environment, right? So you have to be able to have those plain conversations, but you still want to keep people on track from a project management aspect. When you do this and you have a due date and it starts to breach that due date, they get a notification in Teams. They get a little pop-up that says, hey, did you forget about this? You might want to make sure you do it because the meeting's tomorrow and have that regular vulnerability management meeting scheduled, right? Now, another thing that Planner does here that's really valuable is as you start to build in your resources and whatnot, the people and teams that need to remediate things, you'll start to see a schedule. Notice here, create vulnerability scans. I can start as a vulnerability manager and almost start looking at this from a change management perspective. Uh, yes, <laughs> Corvus, I love it. Uh, you know, the add water to coffee maker, do this, do that. Yeah, absolutely. People forget all the time. They're like, oh, we're just going to go check this. Okay, but how? How did you check it? What did you do and when? And by bulleting that out, even in simple bullets, you can say on this date at this time, this was assigned to this individual, and these are the things that they checked. Oh, and by the way, 
attached is the evidence that they did them. Do you know how happy your auditors will be when they see that? They'll be over the moon. And on top of it, it also gives you reassurance that the things are actually done, right? So uh, report as you go. Absolutely, Brian. Yeah, it's reporting as you go, but it's literally like reporting, you know, through the fire. But yeah, absolutely. So I like the task bit. We have the board. We can also do it in a list. You know, you can see a schedule of items. It's all good stuff, right? So let's say, though, that you, you want to do those private channels. You don't want to do the tasks in Planner. Um, you will lose that kind of notification. Yes, I know. I stood up a brand new instance. So it's like, hey, have you heard of this stuff? It's really cool. Teams can do it. Um, so we're going to add something else, though. So we'll go over here. We've got our review items we did in Planner. But there, you can also do this in lists. Now, once you do this once or twice in lists, you can actually use previous lists and you know add an existing list or create a list and do from existing, or you can import an Excel spreadsheet. Assuming you've never done this before, because that's why you're listening uh, to this call, uh, I can go to blank list. And here, again, I might say, uh, I might say, you know, remediation, right? I might have a list for remediation and a list just for those general action items, things that you need to go investigate, right? But once something is no longer something you need to investigate, it's something you know you need to do, put it on your remediation list, right? And you can choose a color and put a description. I'm not going to do that for the sake of time. And what you get, if you've ever used SharePoint, is, hey, look, it's a SharePoint list. But what you can start doing is adding in all sorts of columns and whatnot. Now, I'm actually going to delete this because I actually skipped something that will make your life a lot easier to start. Uh, we're going to go back to the list. And we are instead going to have it let us use a template. There we go. So notice down here, there's actually a bunch of pre-built trackers, expenses, work progress, incidents. Hey, look, issue tracker. Is there really anything different about bug fixes and development than vulnerability management and patch deployment? I would argue no. So let's go ahead and choose that. And note, now it's got a bunch of those columns that you would expect already filled out with the data type, and then you can modify them. So we'll use choose template, and we're going to call this again. We're going to change it to remediation. Cool. And do, 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 do. Excellent. All right. Now, this looks like something you can actually use to track remediation, right? So I've got an issue, I've got an issue description, a priority, a status, like is it done or not? Who's it assigned to? When did we report it? What is the issue source? And you might add other options. But as you're going through, especially that first time, and you say, hey, I need to you know, patch all these Windows systems. I need to patch this Linux environment. I need to do all this stuff. And you're just adding in a ton of them. You can go to edit and grid view and just go you know, one by one by one by one. and uh, go on on down the line uh, entering those issues in. So I'm going to exit grid view here and we'll go into the one I just created because just like our other item, when we pull it up, we get uh, a more normal kind of ticket view, right? So our issue, maybe I'm going to call it like run Windows patch. And then inside of here, maybe I have the, you know, KB number and flush this out KB number uh and other detail right and maybe i also have the priority critical and the status uh in progress i love this field this is where you would go through and say you know, of course i'm the only one in here oh i would go through and assign it to myself uh you can also set this up to go to groups in ad so if you've got this your teams is uh part of your ad you can do that um, date reported, who actually reported it, any images, and then any associated files. So it feels very similar to that other screen, but uh, now you can use it in a private channel if that's what you need to do. Uh, maybe some things Basin doesn't need to know about. Exactly, yeah. Hercafish Basin, he, he's he's nice, but you know he's a little chatty. Um, so you can go through and attach those associated files. Here's 
So I, I mentioned in Planner, you get those notifications, right? So that's a benefit. But the detractors, you can't use it in private channels. With lists, you can use it in private channels. You don't get the notifications, but it also has a benefit that I really love. So let's say you've got an item like this, you know, running Windows, you know, you know, run the patches in Windows, whatever it is. I can go here and go to comments and put my comments in for whatever it is and hit save. And now I get a timestamp who actually made the comment, what they put, right? That just stays with this item. So if you've just got something that you want to put in there for your, like, I did this, this, and this, or I tracked these things. But let's say you have an issue that you need somebody else to help resolve, right? Or you want to raise it during the team meeting about the vulnerability. Instead, you can go to conversation. And when you put the comment in here, it will still show up here with this, but it will also show up in posts. So we've got that. See how I even when I added this review items, even that is tracked inside of here. So an audit will see like you created this, you created that, you created this, you created that. But let's go back to this uh, remediation tracker. Um, so we'll go in here. I'll say this. I'll say conversation. And I'll say stuff broke, yo. Uh, and once I do that and I say enter and I go back to posts, if all someone is doing is looking in posts to see, hey, there's an important piece to this that we need to look at. If you put it in conversations, it immediately puts it in posts and you can start training your teams to say, hey, before the call, make sure you look through the posts since the last time you were there and you'll see any meeting notes, you'll see any conversation items, things we need to talk about. You can also put them there, right? So having that is incredibly valuable for establishing that. How did we respond to that vulnerability timeline? Now, uh, do, 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 going back to the remediation tracker, you could go through and plug those items in over and over again, what, what have you. Um, the other thing that you can change inside of here that I mentioned was I'm going to go over here to assign to. I want to just show you where to change this real quick. Uh, when we go to format column, you get a bunch of, well, as you might expect, column formatting, uh, potentially. Uh, what just happened there? Uh, okay. That was weird. Come on, teams. There we go. Don't know what happened there. But, you know, it wouldn't be a demo if something didn't get quirky. Uh, let's see your column settings. Sure. There. Okay. Um, so we're going to come down here. Notice your type. Multiple lines of text, right? Oh, I clicked on the wrong one. Forgive me. Uh, assigned to is where I meant to click. Column settings. Edit. There we go. Uh, here's where I was talking about before. I can say allow selection of groups. So if you've got like IT Windows administrators or Linux admins or something like that, you can assign it to the group and uh, you'll be able to see that and filter by it whenever you're having those conversations. When you're saying, okay, we've got the Linux team on the phone. Let's filter by assigned to Linux team. These are your action items that are open. You know, where are you at? Uh, you can also go through here, and this was something they added mid-pandemic, allow multiple selections, which was incredibly helpful because you get a lot of people say, well, that's not really me, but I work with this other person and, and that team handles it, but we work together, but none of us own it. I'm like, you both own it. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, so you'll go through and switch those over and now you'll be able to choose multiple people and multiple groups, right? So those are a couple methods that you can use to track your um, uh, to track your tasks and lists and items. The last couple items I want to go over here because uh, we're trying to keep this to about an hour, um, thirty minutes. But I already know I was going to go an hour. Um, the uh, remediation tracker, right? When we go through and we we've got that up there, we've got this other list. We decide if we want to use Planner. Now we've got our our files piece where everything's feeding into. Uh, well, there's some other things that we want to do, though. The other thing that I like to do is I like to create a OneNote that's specifically tied to the channel. And again, why would I do that? I want to create a OneNote that's specifically tied to the channel because then anyone who's in the channel can use it. And later on, when internal audit or an incident responder says, we would like all the notes from the meeting. I don't have to crawl through my OneNote or crawl through email to try and find all the notes. I can come in here. I've got my vulnerability management notebook. 
I say uh, add a page. Um, oh, I actually don't want to. I do add section, meeting notes. Good. And then as I go through and have meetings, what I would end up doing is coming in here and saying, all right, I want to insert. Oh, come back. I want to insert meeting details. And I'm not going to pull this up because you would see my calendar, but you can sign in to your account or if it's already connected, it'll be there. And when you do that, you will see all the meetings coming up on your calendar and you find the next vulnerability management meeting or the one that you're in and you click on it. And what it does is it automatically embeds every everyone who is part of that meeting, what the meeting details were, it puts it all there and then ends with notes colon. And uh, no, you can never create just one one note. No, that is true. Um, and then you take your notes there. But then when audit or someone comes to you and says, well, we, we want that. Well, fine. Just export it. Give it to them. Whatever. doesn't matter. Everything in there should only be related to what you were doing. Right? So we'll create that one note for meeting notes. Again, it stays all in the same area. And then we also want to create a wiki. And the wiki is what I often use to, where am I missing? That's right there. Um, so I'll just call it wiki. Um, but you can call it whatever you'd like. I think I generally leave it as wiki. And the first thing that I'll put in here is summary. Because one of the things that I do after I get this site all stood up is I do like a kind of a Mad Libs email. And I wanted to have a sanitized version of the most recent one up before this, but I eh, didn't get there. But I'll do like a Mad Lib style email, right? Where um, let me pull this over here and I'll, I'll maybe kind of do it sort of live. Um, so I'll do like a Mad Lib style email here where uh, it's to all the people that, that need to know about this vulnerability, whoever the stakeholders are for that particular environment. And I include that. Is that still there? It is. Excellent. I include that email address, right? And the Mad Lib style email for it might be something to the effect of critical vulnerability or vulnerability management process or something like that. So we'll say vulnerability and you train people to get used to when they see that subject line, they know there's something they need to pay attention to, right? So, you know, whatever, the, whatever you choose that's appropriate for your environment. So we'll say vulnerability, uh, whatever it is, whatever it is. And then I might include, um, some detail on it, like uh, POC in the wild or something like that, right? Or something to let them know, hey, this is an issue that we're going to need to deal with. Uh, and here's the CVE number. And then what I'll do is I'll go into a quick summary on, and this is the Mad Lib part on, give me a date. Uh, this organization uh, reported this vulnerability. And I get that same kind of cadence, right? So I'll say this, you know, for this example, I'd say on October 31st, uh, CISA and multiple other outlets reported a vulnerability that was pre-released from OpenSSL around SSL uh, version, uh, SSL version, OpenSSL version three. Uh, this vulnerability allows X, Y, and Z. Uh, there is no uh, current exploitation in the wild. However, a patch is not available and we need to examine com compensating controls as they become available. Then what I'll do is give them a bunch of bullets that just says like, here's when it was found, here's who reported it, here's the systems we think potentially are vulnerable. And then the last thing I will give them is references. And it's it's my classic reading rainbow, you know, LeVar Burton looking at the screen and say, well, don't take my word for it. And it's the kid breaking out the book going, and in this book, we learned about ham. And, and it tells them all about the ham, right? So I'll give them those links, but I will also put those links in here in uh, you know, a new page and call it like, I don't know, research, right? And I'll take all those links, like the ones that I showed you at the top of the webcast uh, of all those things and say, here's all the reference material that we're using. Again, why is this important? It gives me a timeline to say, this is what we knew and when we knew it. And later, if someone tries to move the goalposts and say, well, that wasn't even the issue, it was this other issue. Well, that's cool. We knew that a month later when other research came out and we adjusted appropriately. At the time that we made the decision, this is the information that was available. And that will save you so much trouble when dealing with audit, incident response, PCI forensics investigations, whatever, right? Because if you don't have it written down, it's, it's the old line from training day, right? 
It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. I know I had a conversation about this and we determined it wasn't a problem. Where's your record of it? Can you prove you had that conversation? And if the answer is no, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. So you put all that inside of here. Last thing we're gonna do, and then we'll wrap up with any questions or whatnot, right? Is I'll go through and say, all right, now that I've got that uh, that email written out, and again, I'm not going to go through and do the whole thing. And you might find you want to do it differently than what I said. You might have a corporate communications team that will give you a template and say, hey, this is something executives will pay attention to. And I also promise you the first time you send an email, like what you think is going to be valuable, you will learn an extreme lesson as to how the leadership and stakeholders like to be communicated with. Maybe you get it right. Maybe you know known for a long time, but you will get feedback for sure. And you should listen to it. Because if you're giving them all the information you think they need, but they're not paying attention to it because they're being overwhelmed, they're too busy, it's too long, it doesn't give them the actionable information that they need, it doesn't matter that you're right. It doesn't matter that you think you're right. What matters is if they can absorb that information and actually do something with it. It's the difference between information and intelligence, right? This is a bunch of information and this is great, but what do I do? intelligence is actionable. This is what you do. I need you to do these things. Join this meeting, blah, blah, blah. So we get this email and then I would send it, right? So I'm going to do that, right? Oh, I should have copied myself. Oops. Uh, all right, we'll do that again. Uh, doop. And doop. Meeting! Exclamation point. Cool. So I'm not going to replicate that again, but it's important that I have myself copied and you'll see why in a second. So I would have, you know, all the people on there, the email to teams, myself, anybody else. I hit send. Just like before, this will show up in posts. We'll start to see that, you know, that was the first one that came through. There's the meeting one. But also in my inbox, I have a meeting. I'm sorry, I have an email that looks like this. Why is that important? It's got a create meeting there. You might be tempted to go through and hit that button. Don't. Here's why. A lot of us do this whenever we get an email and we say, oh, hey, here's the, you know, this email. I want to talk to you about this. Create a meeting. And it's a really strong instinct to do that. Don't do that. What you want to do instead is take the email, right? Grab the body of it. And then come over here to meet. And this is a new feature that Teams put in as well. Because for the longest time, I had to like do all kinds of conjiggering with it. Um, go to schedule a meeting. Vulnerability. Add required attendees. I'm going to add myself because I'm really the only person in here anyway. you doing here oh uh, would not be a demo if something wasn't being silly uh let's see here oh that's right you can just do that. all right notice technically as well one of the other reasons i like teams i didn't even touch on this is let's say i do have to bring in external vendors to talk to them about you know are my you know, are these things vulnerable or whatnot? I could technically invite them to this team site. You know, I could bring them in and add them to the private channel, or I could make the channel public for them to get to. You could do all kinds of stuff. The demo gods are being generous today, I'll be honest. Um, so yeah, so I would then paste that email inside of here. Now watch what happens when I do this. Um, we've got a time here, 5.30, that's in a few minutes, that's fine. And I'm gonna hit send. Check that out. Because I scheduled it from inside of here, now the meeting is right there. It's buried inside of here. Also note that I have things like attendance. When I start this meeting, 
and I join it, um, it will take attendance of everybody that joins. I don't know what this is going to do when I do this with Restream. So let's find out. So I'm going to hit join. And obviously there's nobody else in there, but I can go through and I'm going to say start recording, right? This is something else I would highly suggest you do. Now, don't do it surreptitiously. Don't try and hide it from people, but turn on recording and turn on live transcript because you might have 15 people talking, it's chaotic and whatnot, and you're the person running vulnerability management. You say, hey, we're going to record this so later I can go back and get notes. Um, no one generally has a problem with that. Uh, and if they do, you know, ask them why. You know, ask them privately, why, 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 is, why is this an issue? Um, often it's just a matter of trust. Will I get a copy of the recording too? Yes, and you'll see why. Um, so this meeting has started. We could go through. We could, you know, have our chat. We can do, you know, whatever. You'll see here the meeting uh, has started. I can go in and, you know, type in whatever. People can chat back and forth, do files, all the things you're used to doing in a meeting. But when I hit end, now, mind you, I don't think the attendance will trigger because it's just me. But when I hit end, look at all the stuff that's happened here. Vulnerability meeting started. Recording has started. Vulnerability meeting ended. Recording has stopped. Saving recording. And there's my recording. It's all in the same channel. It's not in 500 different places. Now I can go back. I can reference this. And were there multiple people in the meeting? There'd be one more piece here that's an attendance CSV. And it literally has everybody's name, when they joined, how long they were on for, if they were on video, if they were on, like it has all, and again, I don't mean that to sound like, oh, you got to be on video, this, that, and the other. And if you, if you work at a company that does that kind of stuff, yell at them, they're garbage. But you go through and get that attendance inside of there. And then when audit asks you, hey, for that vulnerability that you were dealing with, who attended that meeting? And you're like, oh, I think Steve was there. And Jane might have been on for a few minutes, but I don't know. There was a lot of people there. No, they can just go in there. They joined at this time. They joined over the phone. They were on for 20 minutes. Oh, and by the way, here's a live transcript and a video. Here's exactly what they said. And it all mean, stays in this area. Last thing, and then I'm absolutely done here, is you do, I like to keep track of, like I said, what I call the control vulnerabilities. Um, in the end, you might have compensating controls, right? So I might create a list or I might use the tasks and planner again. And you might have a list of all your controls in your environment, your, you know, your firewall vendor, your email spam vendor, all those different people, right? SaaS services, et cetera. Keep a running log of all the systems and services that provide security controls for you. Because when something like this comes out, you need to do two things. You need to contact those vendors and find out, are the tools that are going to protect us actually vulnerable? And if they are, what do we need to do to fix them? And if they're not, when did you fix them? Or were they even vulnerable in the first place? And capture that. Then the second thing you need to do is, does that vendor actually provide a compensating control for the vulnerability and exploit that you're dealing with? And you say, OK, of my 10 control systems, five of them actually address this. Let's make sure those are turned on. Because you might have to turn something on or reconfigure something or change something so that it's actually paying attention to that. Hear that Amazon laugh? You might actually have to do that. So keep track of it. Because you might be sitting back going, oh, we've got, you know, we've got this WAF, we've got this email control, we've got this whatever. But you never investigated is it actually protecting us or does it just have the capability to do so? So that's it. Um, what time is it? All right, about an hour. So five minutes. Are there any questions? Okay, I see a question here from Christopher. What happens when we touch two sky? I don't know. That's a, I don't know. Uh, no, me let's find out. That's right. Yeah, I don't know. So uh, yeah, so yeah, Corvus, yeah. Huge accountability boom. And you know, a lot of people really say that they're scared of accountability. You know, they're like, oh, I don't want to be on the hook for it. But it's not a bad thing. Accountability, just like an erase chart, doesn't necessarily mean that you have to own fixing it. 
it, it might just mean that you're accountable for making sure somebody else does. It might mean that you're just informed that there's an issue. It might mean, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but what this does is it allows you to work quickly and address the problem while capturing the most amount of detail in a system that hopefully isn't compromised if you're dealing with a really bad situation and also isn't available to potentially other actors who might be listening in, right? Because when you set up that channel, it's not like everyone's in the ticketing system. You specifically put people into that channel and on those calls that you schedule at whatever frequency they need to be scheduled, you can verify. Is this person the actual person I need in there? So yeah, um, it is a huge accountability boon and it does help uh, tremendously when you get around to audit time. So, um, hold on, it's calling me on Teams. Uh, very good. Any other questions? What's this? I mean, tell me in the chat, was this helpful? Did you know that Teams could do this? Is this something that you might end up using? Uh, definitely like to hear your feedback. So either way. Uh, so Ryan, we're about... About at the hour, we'll wait to see if other people come in. Do we have any questions in Discord or anything like that? I don't, I didn't, I don't have Discord. No, up the screen. Discord's piping into here. So what you oh, see okay. is, is from Discord. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so I think we're good then. Um, hopefully, this was helpful to you know a bunch of you who are going to be dealing with you know vulnerability management across the globe and whatnot. Thank you, Douglas. I appreciate. It. I'm glad. I'm glad that was helpful. Um, so hopefully, you know, if you find yourself stuck. And you don't have the tools and you don't have the time and you don't have whatnot. Remember, uh, as much as teams can be frustrating, it can just like good friends, it can also be your friend. So thank you for hearing me out and hopefully it'll help. It can be a great member of the team. <laughs> yeah. And then you pause at the end and we'll right. jump in the air. Right. Cool. All right. Very good. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining. Cool. And with that, we're just two minutes from. 5.30 here on the east side of the United States. So we're going to call it a wrap then. Thanks Great. again, Ian. Thank this you. This was Ryan. awesome. And as, as we like to say, I'm going to kill it with fire now. Kill it with fire.